Hi, I'm Dr. Muscle, and welcome to part one of lecture seven, Hedonistic Utilitarianism. We're going to take a look at Jeremy Bentham, who this guy is, what he's up to. Uh, we'll talk about his relationship to John Stuart Mill, who then we'll turn our attention to in the next lecture. And then we'll talk about what his moral theory is known as, utilitarianism, and we'll flesh out what the theory is in general, right? We're going to take some time to, um, again, carve out what exactly utilitarianism looks like as a moral theory. And then in the second part of the lecture, in the next video, we'll, we will take a closer look at Jeremy Bentham's own utilitarianism, what it looks like in the form that he uh, offers. Um, so that's the game plan again here at the outset in the first part. We're going to talk about very briefly about Bentham and who he is, but mostly about utilitarianism in general and, and sort of what this moral theory looks like, juxtapose it, as we often will throughout the second part of this course, with deontology. Um, that's going to be a prominent theme. Utilitarianism and deontology are going to say polar opposites on almost everything moral. Uh, and so I guess that's something I'll point out here. Uh, even though we're not talking about deontology right now, we're going to be talking about it indirectly throughout the next couple of lectures. Because again, we're going to be juxtaposing what the util utilitarians like Bentham and Mill are going to suggest with what the deontologists are going to suggest. And that'll become clear here very, very quickly. And then, <clears throat> so too, when we get to deontology uh, later in this part of the course, we, we won't drop utilitarianism altogether. Even though we'll be focusing ex more explicitly on deontology, we'll still be talking indirectly all the time about utilitarianism because we'll be contrasting what the deontologists like Kant say with what the utilitarians suggest. Okay, so these two are going to go hand in hand, and that's why I really uh, I spend so much time, basically the whole second part of the course, focusing on, on these two theories, utilitarianism and deontology. I think I mentioned last lecture that utilitarianism is one of the big three. So I, I would argue 95% of uh, people that subscribe to a moral, moral philosophy, they're going to be one of these big three, utilitarianism, uh, deontology, or virtue ethics. Okay, and so... We're turning our attention now to um, utilitarianism. And so uh, the first guy we're going to talk about, Jeremy Bentham, um, I alluded to him in the last lecture on hedonism, lecture six, where we talked about Epicurus and, and his uh, version of hedonism. And we talked a lot about how it's more calculative than a lot of people might initially think when they think of hedonism, uh, right? Oh, and indulge in pleasure. Well, no, it's not uh, this haphazard, you know, constant diving into pleasure that we might at first think, rather it's a more measured, calculated thing. And again, we're going to see how that's very much the case with Bentham. And so I had alluded to Bentham uh, back in the the, uh, the previous lecture as well. So we were already sort of familiar with this guy named Jeremy Bentham. He's a, a British philosopher. I want to say, I don't have his dates right off hand, but I want to say uh, late 1700s for the most part. Uh, he's con connected with J.S. Mill, John Stuart Mill, who we've already talked about. So John... Oops, Stuart Mill. So he was the subject of lecture five, and he'll be the subject of the next lecture, lecture eight, when we talk about refined utilitarianism, uh, the utilitarianism advanced by John Stuart Mill. Right. So we've already talked about J.S. Mill, or so he's often referred to as J.S. Mill. Um, connected to John Stuart Mill, there's a reason why Jeremy Bentham, and then the next lecture, right, John Stuart Mill, why they offer very, very similar moral theories. And that's because Jeremy Bentham was great friends with James Mill. And I think I mentioned James Mill, uh, you know, in the beginning of lecture five, we talked a little bit about the grueling upbringing that John Stuart Mill had at, at the hands of his father, James Mill, right? James Mill, so you can imagine, quite the academic, very prolific writer, very well known during his own day, as was Bentham. Uh, and so these two are very tight, very good friends. And you got to think back then, they didn't have you know, TVs and all these leisure activities that we do nowadays where it's very easy to get sidetracked and forget there's anything even known as moral philosophy. Well, back then, they had nothing better to do than sit around the dinner table for hours on end talking about you know, philosophy, moral philosophy, and so on. So you can imagine a young John Stuart Mill sitting around the dinner table every night, you know, these guys are constantly together, and he's soaking up the, the intellectually stimulating conversations. And again, these guys are academics. I remember how grueling John Stuart Mill's upbringing is. You can only imagine what the dinnertime conversations are like. And so it's no surprise then 
that fast forward, you know, in uh, 40 years or 30 years or whatever, when John Stuart Mill becomes an adult um, and doing his thing and advancing his philosophy, that it's very, very similar to what Jeremy Bentham gave us, you know, 20, 30, 40 years earlier. Okay, so they offer very similar uh, moral philosophies and political philosophies, and that that makes sense since they're um, so closely connected. Okay. Uh, Bentham also made significant contributions, I mentioned this, right, to political and ethical philosophy, as did Mill. Uh, they're both probably, I would say, both mostly known for their moral and political philosophies, primarily. I mentioned that Mill, you know, is, is known for even more. All right, I mentioned, I think, that John Stuart Mill, right, I, I wrote uh, one of my chapters in my dissertation on what he has to say regarding the utility of religion. So he, he talks about a, a lot of different subjects, John Stuart Mill, that is. Um, but I would still say he and Bentham are both primarily known for their political and moral philosophies. Uh, both of them are known for their li liberalism. So Bentham is also known as a philosophical liberal. We talked about what that meant in philosophical circles when we talked in Lecture 5 about John Stuart Mill and his Right, emphasis on the retaining of individual liberties and emphasizing the significance of those and retaining as many of those as is possible. Right? Granted, we need to move away from the state of nature or a state of anarchy. Okay? Both these guys are going to emphasize retaining uh, as many of those individual freedoms and liberties as we, have, as we can, um, while, again, forfeiting some of them for some semblance of security. Okay? So they're both philosophical liberals, was the, the gist of all that. Um, and what... You know, why we're talking about Bentham at this juncture in the course is because he offers, he's really, so they're both, he and John Stuart Mill are kind of known together as the co-founders of utilitarianism, I would say. And that, that's for good reason. I think that's well-deserved. Technically, Bentham's first, right? He's the first one to come on the scene and really articulate the nuts and bolts of the, the view. He offers a crude, rough uh, formulation of the theory, right? Um, one that's going to be torn apart by critics, uh, more or less. And then, and then John Stuart Mill comes along, as I mentioned, 30, 40 years later, offers advances a very similar theory. In fact, I would argue that it's essentially the same theory, um, but he refines it, as the, the title of the next lecture suggests, re refined utilitarianism. That's the, the Mill lecture. That's what it's called. Um, he refines it, so he, he comes in and addresses some of the criticisms that were advanced towards Bentham's formulation of the theory, and you know, he cleans it up. So I, I would suggest, uh, you know, he still offers the same theory, uh, really where there seems to be differences between he and Bentham. They're really just terminological, right? So, for example, um, Mill tends to talk in terms of happiness and unhappiness, whereas Bentham tends to talk in terms of pleasures and pains, but they still mean the same thing, right? What does Mill mean by happiness? He means pleasure in the absence of pain. And what's he mean by unhappiness? Pain in the absence of pleasure. Uh, you will see, see Bentham oftentimes invoking the utility principle, uh, whereas Mill will refer to it as the greatest happiness principle, but it's referring to the same principle. So, um, you know, they're advancing the same theory, uh, and, and I would argue that, again, the, the differences between the two are not significant, right? They're, they're typically just uh, verbal, right, or, or the terms that they're using. Uh, and so there, I, I would say there's good reason why they're both sort of known as the co-founders. So even though Bentham <clears throat> is technically the first one to offer the theory or advance the theory, you know, Mill deserves credit too because he comes along and, and offers a much more cleaned up version where, again, he'll answer a lot of the criticisms. And if you were to take a different course in moral philosophy where only one, um, one sort of lecture was given in utilitarianism or you only read one thing in utilitarianism, it's going to be Mill and not Bentham. Okay, and there's a reason for that because, again, Mill comes in and cleans up the theory, refines it. And so he does deserve some credit. And I think, again, they both are, are equally deserving of this sort of notion that they found the theory, that they're co-founders of, of the theory. So um, just wanted to say that, I guess, give you a little bit of a background in terms of how these guys are connected. And that they're both, uh, for good reason, associated with the foundation of utilitarianism, introducing the moral theory known as utilitarianism. So having said all that, Let's go ahead and turn our attention then to slide or page three, where we will go ahead and try to flesh out what exactly the moral theory of utilitarianism, what exactly it is or what it looks like. Or what is it telling us, right? Uh, we know it's a moral theory. It says something about what's right and what's wrong, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, but what? Okay. So as I start off by pointing out on page three, we're going to go ahead and sort of start to try to describe what the theory is or what it looks like. 
So generally speaking, as I mentioned on slide three, it's a consequentialist moral theory. More on that here in a moment. That judges the moral worth of actions based on the extent to which they promote utility. So, <clears throat> excuse me, utility is just a fancy word for happiness. Okay, so it's generally speaking a consequentialist moral theory that, that judges the worth of actions based on the extent to which they promote utility or happiness. So let's just put, point that out. Utility is happiness, okay? And so utilitarianism is, is a consequentialist moral theory. It's saying what matters morally <clears throat> has something to do with the consequences, okay? So it's a consequentialist theory. And more particularly, it's gonna say what matters is happy consequences, right? Not just any consequences, but happy ones. Okay. So as utilitarians suggest, actions that promote happiness or utility are said to be right, and those that diminish it are going to be said to be wrong. Right? Turning to page four, let's flesh out this relationship between consequentialism and utilitarianism a little bit more here, right? So we know that utilitarianism is a consequentialist theory, okay? Uh, insofar as, again, it's going to say what, what matters, morally speaking, is what results, right? The consequences of the actions. That's how we measure the moral status or worth of, of an action is, has something to do, right, with the consequences. That's why it's consequentialist. I want to take a moment to emphasize that consequentialism is a more general theory. Let me throw this in over here, maybe. So we're talking about the relationship between consequentialism and utilitarianism. Consequentialism is the more general theory, right? And utilitarianism is a version of consequentialism. So consequentialism is, a, consequentialism is the broader theory. It encapsulate, encapsulates not only utilitarianism, but other versions of consequentialism. So um, another way of thinking of that is all utilitarians, by definition, are consequentialists, okay? but not all consequentialists need to be utilitarians, right? So you could be a consequentialist, say what matters morally speaking has something to do with consequences, but not be a utilitarian, right? Maybe it's not the happy consequences that matter to you. Rather, the example I give has something to do with God's will. Uh, yeah, so the example I give at the bottom of slide four right here, now you can imagine a consequentialist who might say that we ought to seek actions that promote, you know, consequences and most in accord with God's will, which may or may not make us happy. Right? Consequences that are in accord with God's will, and a lot of them probably would make us happy, but some of them might not. Right? The idea is that's a version of consequentialism that's not utilitarian. It says what matters morally has something to do with consequences, but it's not the happy ones that matter. It's the ones that are in accord with God's will. Okay? So I think it's important to have a good grasp of that relationship, right? that it is consequentialist, right? Utilitarianism, utilitarianism is a consequentialist moral theory. It's saying what matters is the consequences, right? but there are other consequentialist moral theories that aren't utilitarian. So what does matter, right, is again, the consequences, as opposed to someone like Kant, we're turning to page or slide five here, as opposed to someone like Kant or the deontologists I mentioned, right, we're gonna constantly be reflecting on deontology indirectly throughout these, you know, lectures on utilitarianism, as opposed to the deontologists like Kant, who are going to suggest the moral worth of an action rests upon the intent or motive of the agent, right? What matters morally for Kant and the deontologists is what the agent or the person doing the action had in mind before they did the action. Utilitarians, rather, like other consequentialists, Okay, they emphasize the consequences of the action, regardless of the motive or intention of the person engaging the action. So here's an example I think that is helpful, uh, and then I'll probably refer back to, uh, you know, quite often. Let's take an example like lying. So both these, both these guys, right, both, both Mill and Bentham, and then the, the other guys, the deontologists, right, like Kant. So both the utilitarians and the deontologists both guys, right, both enemies are going to agree that lying is wrong. But why do the utilitarians and why do the deontologists think lying is wrong? That's where they differ. Okay, the, the utilitarians, they say something like, well, look, what matters, right, are happy consequences, what makes us happy. And lying is wrong because on a whole, we recognize that when we 
lie, we tend to be less happy, right? People become more miserable the more they lie. Therefore, since the consequences suck when we lie, lying is wrong. If we could imagine, on the other hand, you know, using our imagination here, a scenario where every time you lie, you actually, on a whole, everyone gained in happiness, then in fact, the utilitarian would say the proper thing to do is lie, okay? But in fact, since it doesn't make us happier on a whole, you know, we have to consider how lying affects everyone, of course. Since on a whole, it, 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 it undermines our pursuit of happiness, then the proper thing to, to do is not lie. Well, that's not why lying is wrong for the deontologist. Why lying is wrong for the deontologist has nothing to do with the consequences. Rather, it has all to do with the action of lying itself. They're going to say, again, that, that the consequences is not what makes lying wrong. Rather, there's something about the act itself. Okay? And the type of person that would engage in, act, in acting in such a way, right? There's, there's something about that that makes it wrong. It's not the consequences, as it is for the utilitarian, that make the act of lying wrong. Rather, it's something about the act in and of itself. Uh, regardless of whatever consequences it might uh, lead to, that makes the act wrong. Okay, so um, lying, I think, is a good example. They both say lying's wrong, but where they disagree is what makes the lying wrong. Okay, utilitarianism is a consequentialist theory. What makes lying wrong is that it it yields bad consequences. Specifically, it, it fails to yield happy consequences. Right? It undermines our pursuit of happy consequences. Uh, that's not what makes lying wrong for the deontologist. There's another example I'll go back to repeatedly throughout the course. Um, and it's just a silly example that I've used for many years. Little Sammy, his name will change every time I use it too. Little Timmy, Little Billy, whatever his name is, helps a little lady cross the street. Right? Imagine this busy highway and little Sammy sees this little old lady trying to cross the street frogger style survive one more day by crossing the street. And little Timmy runs out there, assists her, and she makes it across. She's ecstatic. She lives to see another day. Little Timmy doesn't seem to be put out at all. He's, he's fine. So, hey, is this a morally praiseworthy action? The utilitarian is going to say, well, let's take a look at the consequences. The little old lady is ecstatic. She's still alive. Little Timmy doesn't seem to be upset at all. Good consequences. People are happier. The deontologists are going to say, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, right? Okay, so they seem happier on a whole, but let's, we want to dig a little deeper. What if little Timmy, right, what did he have in mind? What was the impetus for him running out there and helping the little old lady? Lo and behold, when we dig a little deeper, we realize mom and dad threatened little Timmy that if he didn't get out, get his butt out there to help the little old lady cross the street, they're going to ground him from the PS4. Or little Timmy was trying to impress the good looking girl walking behind him. Right. The deontologist says, well, hold up. If we dig a little deeper and we realize this is what motivated little Timmy, he was in, motivated entirely for, by selfish reasons, not by any desire to or um, respect for some duty to, to help you know, people in need. No, he was he didn't want to get grounded from the PS4 or he wanted to impress you know, the girl walking by him. Well, that's a selfish motive. The deontologist is going to say, no, that's not morally praiseworthy. Why would we praise um, someone for acting in an entirely selfish manner? So the, uh, hopefully you're going to start to get a sense for how completely opposite these moral theories are, right? And that utilitarianism, again, what matters, consequence, consequence, consequences, excuse me, right? And whether or not those are good or bad, that's what dictates, right, the moral status of, of actions and whether they're right or wrong. Whereas that, that's not the case at all for the deontologist. No, we have to dig right, into, in, into what precipitated the actions. We have to kind of get into the minds of the moral agents in order to determine the moral status of the action. Um, so a big goal for a big difference in terms of how they view morality. Okay, so bear with me here. This is going to be something we're going to reflect back on quite a bit um, throughout this part of the course. So you definitely want to have a good grasp of what follows here. And this, I'm talking about, what is this, slide six, starting with slide six here. I'm going to try to leave this stuff up for now, but we're going to draw that arrow again up here. So we have an action, and we're talking about consequences are over here. That's what follows from the action. We talked about motive, so the intention of the agent. Okay. So to help us, again, get an idea of what utilitarianism is, though, we also want to talk about how it's 
stereological. So that's where we're going to introduce this idea of a teleological moral theory and juxtapose it with deontological moral theory, which we are already familiar with this idea of deontology, right? We've just been talking about it, right? So as opposed to being deontological, utilitarianism is teleological, okay? And now what do we mean by that? Sorry, guys. Um, let me introduce a few more terms here. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and give us some more room here. Okay, because this is pretty important here. So we're juxtaposing or distinguishing more, you know, teleological moral theories from deontological moral theories. And the best way to get a handle on the difference is to discuss these terms or these ideas of what's good and what's right. Okay. Um, so we're saying, again, utilitarianism is a teleological moral view, okay, as opposed to being deontological. Well, first, again, in order to understand the, the distinction there, we need to have a grasp of what we mean by what's good and what's right. And be very careful here. From here on out, don't use these terms interchangeably. Uh, and oftentimes in moral discussions, these, are, these should not be conflated. What we mean by what's good and what we mean by what's right is not, it depends on who you're talking to, but oftentimes it's not one and the same. So be very careful. So what we mean by what's good, as I point out at the bottom of slide six, it's what we want in life. It's what we desire or aim to bring about in our experience. Okay. And the utilitarians, what are they going to say it is, right? Or what's Epicurus going to say it is? Pleasure, happiness. Right? They're going to define the good in such a way, but not everyone's going to define it that way. Those three guys, Bentham, Mill, Epicurus, they say all that's good for us, the only thing we really desire is pleasure or happiness. Whereas other people are going to say, no, there's a whole slew of other things that we desire and want to bring about. So um, that's what we mean by what's good, though. You know, however you define it, the idea is it's whatever you think we want to promote or bring about in our existence. Okay. Whereas what's right is what we ought to do in a moral sense. Okay. And as we'll see, of course, they're one and the same for the utilitarian, right? What is right or morally appropriate is going to turn out to be whatever promotes the greatest good, right? Um, but to get a handle on the difference between a teleological approach to, to morality and a deontological approach to morality, again, I think it behooves us to talk a little bit about those ideas of what's good and what's right, okay? And so the teleological moral perspective, so I'm turning to, to slide seven here. So a, a view like utilitarianism um, the way it approaches morality, I got to be careful I, how I say this. Don't get the wrong idea. It's not like what, well, it's not like morality doesn't matter, right? Or they don't care about it primarily, right? But the idea is somebody like uh, Bentham or Mill, a utilitarian is going to say, how do we say anything about morality, right? On what grounds do we have to begin any discussion of morality until we first flesh out what it is we desire and, and want to bring about in our lives? Shouldn't we first um, figure that out before we can talk about what's morally appropriate? Um, not only shouldn't we, but the idea is what other choice do we have, right? How do we even get started uh, in, with a moral discussion or figuring out what's morally appropriate if we don't first flesh out or figure out or determine the kinds of things we want to bring about in our existence? Uh, and so it's kind of a practical point, right? Um, so the, the people that advocate this teleological approach to morality, they, they prioritize, the point here is, they prioritize considerations of what's good over and above what's, you know, considerations of what's right. And the reason for that is not because they don't think morality is important, but again, the idea is how else do we begin any discussions of morality without first having this figured out in the first place? We have no other uh, viable approach to morality, right, other than to figure this out first and then do this. And so with the utilitarians, you see that happening, right? Well, they define what's good, happiness, pleasure and avoidance of pain. And then what turns out to be right? Well, whatever promotes happiness and what's wrong, whatever undermines or diminishes happiness or pleasure. Right? So that's their approach. Okay? Um, and then turning to slide eight, though, the deontological moral theorists, right, they reverse that. They want to say people like Kant, you know, they want to say, no, hold up. Actually, what we start with, and the deontologists will oftentimes emphasize our rational capacity. Okay, they're, 
regardless of how, how it is we come to know what's right, okay, the deontologists or those who advance a deontological moral perspective suggest that we start with this knowledge of what's, or we have access to this knowing what's right and what's wrong, right, this moral knowledge. Uh, and then they say, if anything, you want to talk about what's good or desirable, well, it should only be, right, determined through our prior consideration or knowledge of what was right. So um, what that means is Kant's going to say, like, well, is money a good thing? It depends. Does the person who has the money, are they, do they do the right thing from a moral perspective? Are they morally a righteous citizen? Well, then, yes, their money is a good thing. Are they, you know, terrible people? Well, then, no. Their, their money is not a good thing. So somebody like Kant, a deontologist, is going to reverse that and say, look, we start with kind of this moral knowledge, you know, and how we have that knowledge, you know, they'll differ. Kant's going to say we have a rational capacity that allows us to sort of reflect on things we'd want to be universalized and so on and so forth. Regardless, right, the different deontological moral theorists are going to say we have this kind of prior knowledge of what's right and wrong. We start with that and then, right, through our prior discussions and discerning what's right, we ought to then define what's good through our prior knowledge of what's right. And so that's what, like what I was just saying, what Kant says regarding like things like money, right? Is something good? It depends. Does the person who has that potentially good thing, do they do the right thing? Are they a morally praiseworthy person? Okay, if so, well then having a good job is a good thing for them or having money is a good thing or, you know, yada, yada, yada. It's all great. It's desirable. I want them to, you know, have these desirable things. But if they're terrible people, then no, right? Uh, think of somebody experiencing happiness, Kant would say. Do we want to... Um, think of the happiness of a criminal as a good thing. No. He, why think of that as a good thing, right? We don't want criminals to be miserable, Kant would say. So, again, we ought to define what's good or desirable through this moral lens that we already started with. Okay, so, again, their approach to morality completely different. Teleological moral views. we got to figure out what it is we desire and, and want to bring about in our experience, and then we can sort of define what's right and wrong in terms of that. A deontological moral theorist, no, we start with, however it may be, right, we start with this moral knowledge, and then we ought to think of what's desirable in terms of our prior moral knowledge. Right? And this will all become much clearer as we then go through these thinkers, right? I, I'll go back to this. You'll, you know, fast forward as at lecture 12, I think is the Kant lecture. I'll go back and say, this is exactly what we were talking about at the beginning of the Bentham, Bentham lecture, right? When I was talking about him prioritizing the right over the good. Okay. When he says, in fact, I'll even tell you that exact moment, nothing in the world can be considered good without qualification except a good will. That's the quote I'll mention in the Kant lecture. And that is exactly what Kant's getting at when he says that. Of course, that is complete rambling to you right now. But flag that. We will come back to this again. This distinction, this, this whole idea here, the juxtaposition here, it's going to become a lot clearer as we proceed. So if it's a little hazy right now, don't worry. Again, we'll be reflecting back on this constantly throughout the next four, five, six lectures. Okay. So, again, hopefully you're kind of getting a general idea. We talked about how utilitarianism is consequentialist and it's teleological. And hopefully that's making a little bit more sense now what we mean when we say utilitarianism is teleological. And by the way, teleological is a Greek term that means kind of more or less future oriented, right? So morality has something to do with bringing something about for the teleologists, right? So a tele and that makes sense. So the tele teleological moral theorist, morality has to do with producing something in the future, right? Good stuff. The things we wanted to, we desire to bring about in our experience. Morality is all about producing that. Okay. okay, blah, blah, blah. Let's move on then to, this will be slide nine. I think this is going to be the last sort of thing we'll talk about before, um, taking a break and then moving on to the second part of the lecture. And that's an important distinction here. So I want to mention this because it, and they mentioned it in the introduction to uh, utilitarianism in the textbook too. There's a very prominent distinction that you'll see uh, a lot about in contemporary scholarship on utilitarianism. And that distinction is between act and rule utilitarianism. So I think it, the first point we want to hammer home is that, look, both act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. So both of these, we're distinguishing between versions of utilitarianism. And this, as the 
um, editors of the uh, textbook that we're using pointed out, all right, um, this all is post-dates Bentham and Mill. So they, they weren't aware of this distinction uh, when they were advancing their, their versions of utilitarianism. So contemporary utilitarians have brought forth this distinction and classified themselves as either act utilitarians or rule utilitarians. Um, you know, why this distinction or, you know, why did this come about? And I think really it was born out of uh, kind of a respect for one of the criticisms of, the, criticisms of utilitarianism. And that was that it seems incredibly taxing, difficult, if not impossible to carry out. Right, we're we're required. So, what is utilitarianism in general? Right, it's the theory that suggests that we ought to to do whatever promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And we'll hammer that home in much more detail in the second part of this lecture. Right, do whatever promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Okay, well, how exactly do I go about doing that? I mean, that seems to involve a lot of calculations because the greatest number means it's not just me. What makes me happy? That'd be a lot easier to figure out. No, I have to figure out. You know how this affects seemingly everyone and not only people right as we'll talk about in the second part of this lecture bentham seems to want to open up the consideration to all sentient creatures okay? and what you know what time period do i have to consider how this affects the happiness of the greatest number of sentient beings you know just right now or how it's going to affect them you know three months from now three years from now 30 years from now so there are all these you know huge practical concerns with utilitarianism and, and by the way as we go through all these major theories, we're gonna I'm gonna do my best to allude to you know all the practical you know not all of them but major practical concerns and there will be a whole host of you know practical concerns for all these moral theories <clears throat> and so this is a huge one for utilitarians right how feasible is it to require of moral agents of people to how feasible is it to re to require of them that they go around making these seemingly very complicated calculations all the time. I mean, remember back in lecture one, I, I tried to make the argument that in some sense, we're facing a moral, moral dilemma every waking moment of our lives, if that's the case, and we're required to perform these utility calculations in every moral dilemma, that's all, that's all it, it looks like that's all we're doing is making utility calculations all the time. And isn't that itself undermining our pursuit of pleasure? If we're constantly being taxed and required to perform these calculated, you know, complicated calculations, isn't that going to undermine our pursuit of pleasure? I mean, our, how can we be happy when we're doing that? And so these are, you know, very legitimate, I think, concerns that many utilitarians recognize. Okay? Maybe they like the general idea of promoting happiness for the greatest number, but a lot of util utilitarians could appreciate this concern for how practical, in fact, carrying out the theory would be. <clears throat> and so, <coughs> excuse me, I think the whole reason why I mention all, all that now is I think that sort of concern was the impetus then for uh, the creation or the the emergence of the distinction here and this camp of rule utilitarian. So what is the, the distinction here? Uh, I want to go back and, and point out the beginning, emphasize the beginning. These are both versions of utilitarianism. And the reason why I emphasize that is because it gets really weird, as we'll see in the next slide, because they can actually end up recommending two uh, conflicting courses of action, right? And I'll give you an example here in a moment where the rule utilitarian actually recommends the same course of action as the deontological or as the deontologist, and they're both at odds with the, the act utilitarian would recommend. Uh, and so that seems really weird, right? But understand, still, while they are at times recommending different courses of action, they're both ultimately aimed at the same thing: maximizing happiness for the greatest number. The difference lies in how they think we can best go about accomplishing that methodologically. So the difference lies in their methodology, right? The best um, process for actually accomplishing that, right? Maximizing the greatest happiness for the greatest number. That's where they differ. Okay, so don't lose sight, again, that they're both versions of utilitarianism. So even when the rule utilitarian on the next slide recommends the same course of action as the deontologist, it's not for the same reason, okay? It's because he or she thinks that in following whatever rule applied, they would promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number, right? Which is not ever the reason why we ought to do something for the deontologist, okay? So now let's talk about the difference though. So I mentioned or alluded to why it might be that rule utilitarianism emerged, and that's because there was this appreciation for the immense practical concerns of actually carrying out utilitarianism, 
And so we have this emergence of rule utilitarianism. The idea is let's simplify things. Okay, so instead of requiring people to constantly perform all these calculated or complicated calculations, let's just establish rules of thumb, right? Or general rules um, that they just apply all the time. So rather than constantly figuring out what we ought to do in every particular scenario with all its unique, uh, you know, uh, circumstances and so on, just have these general rules that we always apply to whatever situation we come across, right? So. Um, time one, time two, time three, time four. And the idea is we don't have to constantly analyze every particular situation. So the, the act utilitarian says, for better or worse, whenever you're deciding what you have to do, you have to analyze the particulars of every particular dilemma, right? How do I define here? The right action at any given time is whatever action is thought to yield the greatest happiness in that particular instance. So for the act utilitarian, every scenario you're confronted with, you have to analyze exactly, you know, figure out how people are going to be affected, you know, all the things we talked about earlier. Whereas the rule utilitarian wants to say, no, don't require moral agents or people to constantly perform all these complicated calculations. Just have them apply general rules, right? So, so for example, uh, generally it, it isn't in our interest to lie. So let's make the rule, right? If we don't lie, generally speaking, here's a rule, don't lie. The idea is, hey, sometimes if we lied, we might have been happier. But as a rule in general, when we don't lie, we're better off. So rather than requiring people to constantly analyze the situation to figure out, well, should I lie here? Should I lie here? No, just don't lie in general. The idea is, in general, we'll be better off, right? Because while here, if you had lied, maybe we would have been slightly better off if you had lied. All things considered, and not re being required to constantly perform all these calculations, you actually got a little happier as well. And we were better off still just generally not lying, okay? Even though there might have been one or two instances where, in fact, lying would have produced slightly more happiness, you still had to, if, if you would have analyzed each of those particular instances, that would have been taxing in itself, right? And you have, would have had to have uh, uh, incorporated the negatives associated with constantly performing those calculations, the rule utilitarian says. And so, on a whole, we're still better off, again, following the general rule of don't lie, okay? even though there might be those particular instances where, again, a little bit more um, negative was yielded. Or how, uh, hopefully you're following. And I guess, uh, the example I'll give here in a moment, um, I think, um, nicely captures that. The rule utilitarian, again, wants to say, don't require such complicated calculations every waking moment of their life. Rather, have these general rules that they can all apply much easier. Right? It's much easier to just have these 10 guiding principles, right, that you just always apply, and then you don't have to worry about making specific calculations. So for example, uh, this is the bottom of slide 10, Plato's, Plato's fa famous Mad Men example. This is from uh, the Republic, and I'm just going to offer a more contemporary version of it. So imagine you loaned your hunting rifle to a neighbor, or sorry, your neighbor uh, loaned their hunting rifle to you, uh, and you know, a few, few, few days ago, and all of a sudden, you hear a pounding on your door, uh, your your neighbor is in a fit of rage. I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill her. Where's that gun? Right? He wants his gun back. Now, you know the gun is in your coat closet two feet away, right? But the, the dilemma is, do you give this man his gun, knowing that he seems very upset and is saying he's going to go kill uh, her, whoever that is? Or do you lie? Okay? You lie. So, what's the act utilitarian say you ought to do? Again, you got to try to think about well, what's going to promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number. You know, figuring out how, you know, I could either lie and say I don't know where this gun is, or I can give him the gun. Say it's right here. I know right where it is. Here you go. And give him the gun. Those are the two options. So the act utilitarian is going to say, you have to analyze every particular instance, right? So here, if you lie, you're going to save a life, right? Whereas if you tell the truth, give him the gun, presumably he's going to go and kill her. So the act utilitarian is going to say, whoa, losing a life, way worse, right, than lying here and saving a life. So tell the lie. The deontologists, as we'll get into down the road, they, they say it's never appropriate to lie. All right, we have a duty to tell the truth because you can't universalize, um, you know, not telling the truth or, or lying. So for them, we have a duty to tell the truth, and the responsibility lies on him if he goes and takes the gun. Right, they're going to make that kind of argument that it's not on you. Right, your duty is always tell the truth and so on. So the deontologist is going to say, don't lie. Again, tell them where the gun is, and then if whatever he ends up doing that's on him the rule utilitarian is going to have pre-established rules okay again in general 
don't lie, right? That's a rule. So don't lie. You don't have to make the complicated calculation here. You don't have to think about it anymore. That general rule is don't lie. So here they would say, what's a deontologist? Tell the truth. Here's the gun. Right? The idea is, well, here, right, we had a, a huge negative in terms of happiness because then he goes off and kills her. But the idea is in the long run, again, by not requiring the agent to constantly make these calculations, we're still better off, so says the rule utilitarian. Even though we might have those instances, right, we're still better off in the long run. We're still going to promote more happiness because we're not constantly requiring people to make these, co these complicated calculations. Now, in fairness to the rule utilitarian, if there was a rule utilitarian here, they might object and say, oh, come on, we don't have, our rules are more nuanced than, than that, right? You know, we, we have a, we'd, have, we'd offer rules like, you know, tell the truth unless somebody's life is at stake. Uh, but then the, you know, the act utilitarian would, would counter that by saying, well, at some point, right, you, you know, if you're going to make these qualifications and if you're going to offer that nuanced of a rule, at what point is it not just becoming act utilitarian then if you're making all these kind of qualifications? We'll tell the truth unless yada, 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 yada applies. You know, the argument will be, well, then that's not really rule utilitarianism anymore. You're, you're taking into, into account all these variables. Uh, but, but setting that aside, I just wanted to say, in fairness, the rule utilitarian, right? They, they might object to me suggesting maybe just right, right offhand go with don't lie, right? They would probably have more nuanced rules. But I just wanted to capture, give you an idea in general of the difference between act and rule utilitarianism. Again, they're both after the same thing promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But how we can best get there, that's where they differ. The rule utilitarians seem to recognize you know, the concerns of the critics in terms of um, unduly taxing everyone by requiring them to make all these calculations. So let's simplify things, just make rules, and just always apply them across the board. Uh, again, act utilitarians know, look, it might be stinky that we have to make these calculations, but that's the proper thing to do. Uh, nobody said doing the right thing would be easy. Says the act utilitarian. Okay, so again, both versions of utilitarian, utilitarianism both aimed at promoting the greatest happiness for the greatest number, which is never the case for the deontologist. Okay, all right, so that's going to end part one of this very important lecture. Don't um, lose sight of you know these these terms, consequentialism, right, and the idea that utilitarianism is consequentialist and what that means. You know, remember what it means to be teleological and the idea that utilitarianism is teleological. Very important concepts here that, again, we will be referring back to throughout not only this part of the course, but really the rest of the course in its entirety. So we're ready for intermission here. I really like this intermission, actually. Uh, we have the famous trolley dilemma or dilemmas. Really, there's like countless versions of these now. Hopefully, you'll get a kick out of that video. It's very short. I, I think it does a great job of these trolley dilemmas of capturing the issue, right, with utilitarians and seems so, or for a lot of the critics anyway. I mean, on the face of it, it seems so impartial and so, right, it's treating everyone the same and everyone matters and it's all about happiness and pleasure. But then, man, when you throw in like requiring people to like pull levers, you know, and become involved and just so that with fewer people will die, right? I mean, that, that seems to seems to um, not be a straightforward, right? It seems like a tougher sell. And especially then, so throughout the years, you get more and more uh, variations of these trolley examples and so on. And uh, I'll give you another example too in a moment where, you know, you take that basic utilitarian, utilitarian principle, which at first just seems so convincing, but then when you get these other hypothetical examples, it makes you question it more and more and more. So that basic trolley dilemma though, right? Um, so the, the intermission questions are, you know, asking you about the trolley dilemma, what would you do in each case, and you know, why is it? So the, the first example, right, is there's a trolley here, and or sorry, the trolley going here, right, and it's on a track, and it's headed for five people. Okay, but you can pull a lever here, which will then switch its path to go and only kill one, but then you become an active participant. Right? And so, what should you do? Okay, the deontologist is going to say, you stay hands off, right? Whatever happens, that's not on you. But the utilitarian, as we'll see in subsequent lectures when we talk about the idea of negative responsibility, is going to argue you had the option or ability to promote a much greater evil from happening. If you don't do something about it, pull that lever, you're partially responsible. And so the, all utilitarians, and, and seemingly many, many, if not most, if not all, well, probably not all, but you get the idea, right? 
many, 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 many people are going to be on board with having the idea of having to pull that lever. You ought to pull that lever. But then it gets interesting, right? What if instead we imagine a bridge, right? And there's this really big dude sitting here, and there's a trolley coming under the bridge that's going to run into these guys unless we push this dude over. And if we do, then that's going to stop the trolley somehow, right? That's the idea. Same, isn't it the same issue, right? We do something that kills one person, leads to the death of one person, but then in doing that something, we then avert the loss of five lives instead of just one, right? So what is the difference between the two? And I think it's fascinating, right, as the video points out, that while like 95%, and, and this has been verified in numerous uh, studies, by the way, while 95% of people will pull the lever, a much smaller percentage are willing to push the fat guy over the bridge or the large guy over the bridge. Why is that? And then it gets, right? So you can see what I was saying earlier, right? What well, seems like a pretty obvious thing, pull a lever, right? One versus five. Well, it, it gets harder and harder. Well, what if I have to push somebody over a bridge? Well, what about you have like, I don't know exactly the first formulation or how this, but there's so many formulations of this, but what, imagine a hospital, right? Where we have five people that are on their deathbeds. So these guys are on their deathbeds, right? But we have one perfectly healthy guy over here. And, you know, he's just waiting in the waiting room for, for whatever reason, for whoever. And the idea is, you know, one of the doctors says, hey, let's take him, right? This dude needs a, a new heart. This guy, you know, they all need different things. Uh, otherwise, they're going to die. This guy has, he's perfectly healthy and has all the different parts that each one of these people needs, right? You know where this is going now. So would it be justified? John Stuart Mill, the doctor, right? John Stuart Mill, should we kill him, use all the parts then, and then make these guys perfectly healthy in theory, right? I'll assume for the sake of argument, they could then be perfectly healthy, right? Would, it be, would we be justified to kill the one perfectly healthy individual, perfectly innocent healthy individual, to then save the lives of five others. And a lot of people are reluctant to do that. But what's the difference? So what is the difference between that and this and then that and the lever example? Are they not all underneath it the same? Right? Do something that kills one but saves five? If they're not all this essentially the same, what is the relevant difference? So mull over those kinds of issues. Love this uh, intermission um, pick. Uh, to, to respond to one of these. It's usually pretty good discussion. So mull over that. Uh, when we come back for part two of the lecture, we'll then dive into Bentham himself and talk about his rough formulation of utilitarianism and the specifics of, of his theory and what he has to say. So uh, thanks, and we'll, we'll see you for the second part of the, the lecture.